Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all rolling in. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good midday, depending on your time zone. I'm Ashley Lukens. I'm part of the Center for Food Safety team serving as your host today. We'd love for you guys to drop your name and where you are Zooming in from in the chat um, so we know who's joining us. Again, I am Zooming in from Honolulu, Hawaii. Julia, where are you joining us from? Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, Arizona. Good morning, Annabelle from Erie, Pennsylvania. Good morning, Sandra from Miami, Jane from Durham, North Carolina. Behind the scenes, we have our brilliant Maria Jure joining us from Los Angeles, California. Richard from Whitby Island, Washington. Nice to see you. Melissa's joining us from PETA. So nice to see you. Noreen from San Diego. Sharoni from Israel. Shalom. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Good morning, Patty from Berkeley Springs. I see a fellow Hoosier in there, Nancy hey. from Indianapolis. <laughs> That's right. It's so amazing when we do these events to see everybody across the country and across the world that are interested in this topic. And I have to say on the call New today, Zealand. what's that, Michael? New Zealand, from yeah. New Zealand. Yep. Hey, someone from New Zealand. Hi, Phyllis. Nice to see you. It's Molly from Cornwall right? in the UK. That's the middle of the night there. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Gary. Another Whidbey Islander. You guys should get together. You could have a Zoom party. Um, oh, J.D. Hansen, our own Center for Food Safety Policy Lead. Uh, nice to see you, J.D. We're looking forward to your great questions in the chat. Good morning, Sydney from Wincote, Pennsylvania. Um, I hope I said that right. Um, it's nice to see everyone. We're gonna get started in a minute. Um, feel free to grab your coffee. It's gonna be a, an exciting and engaging hour with you. Good morning, Bill Freeze, our staff scientist, the hero of our week. Um, Bill was a played a leading and critical role in our glyphosate victory last Friday. If you guys don't know what the Center for Food Safety and our partners at Food and Water Watch um, helped to achieve on Friday, um, please, we'd love for you to look it up. We can drop a link to that press release in the chat. But let's just say that we posed a formidable and maybe insurmountable challenge to Monsanto in their reapproval of glyphosate on both human health and environmental health grounds. It was a slam dunk win for us legally. And it's certainly something to feel really hopeful about. Um, so again, hi to Bill, hi to everyone. Um, today, we are going to be having a conversation that I desperately need to have, which is about cell cultured, lab grown, cell based meat. What is it? Is it safe? Where is it? Where is it is a major question that I have. Um, and what are we gonna do about it? If it's entering into our food supply at any kind of scale, who are the regulatory bodies that are gonna protect us? And who are the folks that are pushing for this innovation in the food system? And what are the potential consequences of the lack of regulation of this technology in our food supply? Um, again, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Ashley Lukens. I'm with the Center for Food Safety team. Um, and I'd love for our panelists to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about why they're joining the conversation today. So Michael, I'd love to start with you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Michael Hansen. I'm a senior scientist at Consumer Reports Magazine and I've been there for a little over 30 years and I work on food safety and technology issues, making sure that anything new that's coming to the market is both safe, 
uh, and that it's appropriately labeled. And in this regard, after working on GMOs and other things, it's the new thing is now this um, lab-based meat or in, in vitro meat or cell-based meat, whatever you want to call it. In vitro meat. Tom, tell us about <laughs> yourself. Yeah, my name is Tom Neldner and I'm with the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm a senior director for Safer Chemicals and I've been focusing for the past 12 years on chemicals and food and realizing just how broken FDA's review system is. I, I'm a chemical engineer and a lawyer, so I've worked on making drugs and different chemicals from fermenter reactions like this. Um, not this technology though, but that was many, many years ago when I was young. Mm, thanks, Tom. We weren't young many years ago. Um, and Julia, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, I am Julia Ranney. I work at the Center for Food Safety. I play a dual role in policy and creative communications. So as of right now, I'm helping produce an organizational podcast called The Hero's Journey that we're very excited about. And I also do policy and research related to various topics as they relate to the food system. Um, but I've been studying novel foods, GMOs, synthetic biology, personally, professionally, and academically for the past 10 years. And I'm super excited to cover this topic. So I know you were one of the people that kind of pushed for this webinar today. So help me understand, what is cell-based meat? And where is it in our food supply at this point? Yes, so I think that Michael can give a more scientific definition of what it is, but essentially you biopsy an animal and you take some cells and then you cultivate said cells in a lab to create a meat-like product. Is that correct, Michael? Uh, yeah, basically what you do is the first part is you have to take a, go into a live animal, take a piece of their flesh, like part of their muscle, and then you wanna turn that cell into what's called a stem cell that you can then uh, grow in a fermentation vat, add, add a bunch of chemicals and other inputs, and you wanna get that to differentiate into a muscle cell, and then you go from there. Yeah, I just, have a feeling, oh. Just if one you, other thing, it's, it's a, like a, if you got a tank full of protein for the meat, a tank full of fat and a tank full of plasma, and then you, in, you make extrude well, them into a, something that looks like the food we're familiar with. Um, uh, except you don't really use any plasma to, in the end product. There is, um, they are using plasma from uh, cattle or other things to help the cells grow, but most of the companies are actually saying that when they uh, produce the product for sale, at least the top six of them have said, we are not gonna use any material uh, you know, any of this fetal bovine serum. Uh, they're gonna use, they suppose are gonna use plant sources because they want this meat to be quote, cruelty free. And that's actually a big issue is, is whether they can actually do that, whether they can create this product without using this bovine serum. So far they haven't really been able to do. Okay. First of all, I think if you freeze frame this webinar at any point in time, my face is gonna be in this like, shock pose. I just want to rewind and say this very slowly for our listeners today. So cell-based meat is not beyond meat. We're not talking about impossible burger. Is there any cell cultured in vitro meat on the market today? Not in the U.S., um, as of right now, the only place cell cultured meat is available is in Singapore as of December 2020, and it's just one product, I believe, cell based um, chicken in a very small quantity. Okay, so if right. I really want to leave this webinar and race and get some cell based meat, go to Singapore, cell based mm -hmm. chicken. But the what? process for making cell based meat is to take some genetic material from a living organism extract it to get the stem cells, which grow on their own. And then those stem cells provide the like basis of 
they turn into, uh, you're not extracting anything. What you're doing is you're taking living cells from an animal and you're putting them in a nutrient solution and you're getting them to turn into muscle cells, which is the basis of meat. And the Singapore product I should point out is actually their chicken nuggets and they're a mixture of both uh, the cell-based chicken and then there's other plant products and other things in there right now. They've also just approved supposedly uh, chicken meat, although people haven't seen that yet. And again, that's only in Singapore. Only in Singapore. Julia? So just so I understand, how is this technology different than the technology used to create the Impossible Burger. I know they both use synthetic biology, but this feels like a step in a totally different direction. It is with basically with the Impossible Burger, what they did is they used genetic engineering or what people would call GMO technology to, to create a single protein, the soy leg hemoglobin. Here, what they're doing is they're using liver, living cells, but to get them to differentiate the growth factors and the differentiation factors and all these other things that you're going to have to add into the soup, those are going to be coming from engineered cells, from engineered bacteria, from engineered yeast. So most of the inputs to this cell cultured meat are actually going to be recombinant proteins or engineered materials, which are used to produce all the growth, as I said, growth factors, hormones, differentiation factors that, that are needed to turn an individual cell into muscle tissue. So that's what the difference. In both cases, you're using genetic engineering, but it's far more complicated in the cell-based meat case. And so that's why we're sort of at the edge of technology, whereas you know, genetic engineering, you're usually just producing one or a couple of things in a particular um, bacteria or living organism. Okay, great. I think I feel clear. There's a question in the chat, which I think is, is useful right now, which is what is the original source of the protein in cell-based meat? And I think for those of us who are, are vegans and vegetarians in the room, um, is it extracted humane, like, Tell us a little bit about that sourcing process. You literally take a biopsy. So that means what you're doing is you're, you're pushing a hollow needle into the muscle of an animal and taking a piece of the muscle out. You then put it in a nutrient solution to turn it into what's called a stem cell. And that's what will generate all the types of muscle cells you might need. So you get it, you pull it out of a uh, muscle by as I said, by taking a piece of flesh from the muscle of an animal, you then take that uh, muscle fiber and you turn it into an undifferentiated cell into the stem cell that reproduces supposedly forever. And so you can take bits of that and put it into a big vat that you've added all this nutrients and other solutions to get those cells to divide and to turn into muscle cells, the, these myofibers, which you can then harvest to make your meat product. So yes, the original thing has to come from literally punching and taking some flesh out of the animal to turn it into, you know, whether it's a chicken or a pig or a fish or whatever. And, and just to understand, much of the, from a weight, it's the nutrients that are being grown from these cells. So that's going to be your oils, your sugars, all those ones. And that's not really well defined now. That's going to be proprietary to that company by and large. So we don't know what the nutrients are or even whether it's going to be sustainable or good for the climate because the technology is still being developed and it's still a little bit of a black box. Why are we doing this? Like walk me through the justification for it's this. It's a good, it is a good pitch to venture capitalists on Wall Street because the idea is, is they can say a major source of greenhouse gas emissions are industrial animal production. 
right? That produces greenhouse gas emissions. Animals are raised in horrendous conditions. And so here's a way to produce meat without the animals, without causing them to suffer. And you won't have all the greenhouse gas emissions from that animal agriculture. We can produce all the meat, quote, cruelty-free in a nice sterile environment for people. So it's supposedly a win for the environment, a win for public safety, and a win for animal welfare. It's a nice story that you can tell somebody on Wall Street that they can throw a lot of money at. I don't see it growing big enough to displace all of those and get all those climate benefits of reducing cattle, but it is a way to meet the growing demand for protein and to put it in the communities where it's happening if it works. If we get the technology and it's evaluated for sustainability, it's largely because the promise of meeting the protein demand helping to reduce the agricultural burden, uh, the climate burden from agriculture, and uh, some sustainability. Those promises are what it's being built on now. Converting those promises to reality may be as difficult as turning that little sample into a steak. Yeah, I'd also like to add, it's not just the climate promises. I read promises associated with antibiotic resistance, um, human to animal viral transmission, world hunger. There's been many claims made to address several existential crises. And also, I just recently read that the cultured meat uh, business is valued at will be valued at $25 billion by 2030, assuming that the product can become cost competitive by 2030. But again, this is purely speculative. So we're given this technology sort of bandied about in the realm of the imagination to some extent, given all these promises, like all genetically engineered crops have been given these promises of climate resilience, environmental sustainability, um, who's pushing this? Like, what are the, what's the actual corporate infrastructure behind the research and development of lab grown meat, but more importantly, the investment in it as a viable future business within the food system? Julia, you want to start and you can pass it to sure. Michael? Um, so there's a variety of investors. I mean, Michael already covered venture capitalism is the venture capitalist firms are the primary investors right now. And if you go and look actually into who they are, their impact investment funds, a lot of them are just investing in the alternative protein sector. Um, but you also have large multinational food companies now who are investing, including the largest meat companies in the world. So JBS has invested. Um, ADM, Archer's, AMD, Archer's Midland, Daniels. Um, Archer's Daniel Midland. Thank you. <laughs> BRF. Um, there are many. Uh, Nestle has now partnered with a cultured meat company. So we all, Cargill, yes, thank you, Stephen. We also have seen uh, tech billionaires are investing. Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Sergey Brin, celebrities are investing, Leonardo DiCaprio, Coldplay recently invested, Ashton Kutcher. Um, but and it's not just they about, invested, invested in who? They invested in specific cultured meat companies. Um, there are, in the US, the two companies who are making the most, getting the most money, primarily from venture capitalist firms, are Upside Foods and Just Meats cultured meat department, good meat, because they are the companies, there are a couple in Israel as well, but they are the primary companies getting the money to build out the large bioreactors that promise to create mass amounts of this product. Michael, do you have anything you wanna add on that? No, they got it right. Uh, one thing I will add since I'm looking at the questions to respond to, Noreen. Yes, there are other ways to get cells. You don't have to get them from a biopsy. You can take them from a slaughtered animal or from a tissue bank, but most companies are going to want to have their proprietary lines because all these things are going to be patented. So that's why, at least for the initial stages, they tend to be going with the biopsies, but there are other ways. 
So we'll get into the technical questions in the Q&A because I do want to sort of transition a little bit to is this safe and who's regulating this? And Tom, I know this is sort of your sweet spot, but it sounds like you have something else you want to say before we go into that. Well, I just wanted to get, there's two, one area is meat and then the other area is seafood. And seafood seems a little farther along from my perspective. Um, and it's about being able to deliver year round a, a particular seafood, or it's one that can't be grown in, uh, in farm raised. So you got to think of it as two different categories because I think the markets are different. I mean, this is, I'm sorry, I am just floored. This is wild. Like, do these companies honestly believe that consumers will eat seafood that's engineered in a lab? And Julia, I know you mentioned this thing called a bioreactor. So I'm wondering too, if somebody can help me break down as we bring these cells into a lab, like what is a bioreactor and what role does it play in making this cell-grown, cell-based meat, cell-cultured meat? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that to Michael because he will have more specifics. Yeah, basically what a bioreactor is, think of it as just a big tank, a fermentation tank. And rather than uh, producing alcohol in it, it's this nutrient solution that has all these cells swirling around in it. And then what they'll usually do is they have to add some kind of scaffold. In animals, you know, those are bones and other things. So what they do is they'll create some kind of scaffold for the cells to glom onto. And then that's how they can harvest it out of the vats that have all these nutrients in them. And I should point out from a question, the proteins that are being added to the solutions some of those, uh, a vast number of those will be engineered. Now the question will be, will they, will they be engineered to an existing protein or might they be modified to, for example, uh, optimize their production? And both is probably gonna happen. Cause I've seen, for example, in the last couple months, they said that they've made a, a new breakthrough in being able to use recombinant albumin in place of some of the cereal you would use from cattle. And now they're trying to grow that out, so. Where do you get this information, Michael? Like, are you on sort of the investor reports? Like, how are they communicating? No, in the scientific thing? literature, there's a lot of, in the technical literature, people have been trying to get this to work. So there's all sorts of review articles out there. What's interesting that is not out there is there is not a single publication that I've seen yet that has said, okay, here's, here's what we did. Here's the piece of meat at the end of the product. Here's, we're gonna send that out to be analyzed to see what its nutritional characteristics are compared to a piece of meat, you know, a ground meat from the animal. That still hasn't been done yet. And I would point out that even the folks in the Meat Science Society, these are academics that study this. These are not people that are uh, hostile to industry. They still haven't seen a single sample yet. So it's hard to talk about safety issues or nutritional issues until you've got something to actually study. And nobody's published that on that yet, which what that tells me is they must be having a lot of problems behind the scenes because if they were able to do this with as much success as they say, you would see something out in the technical literature of this is what we did, here's the end product, here are its characteristics. We still don't have that. So Tom, yeah, I'd love for you to jump in here because for those of us who live in the US, the Food and Drug Administration is the appointed regulator for these products as they're trying to enter our marketplace. Can you give people a sense of, A, what does the FDA do and how would they review and analyze the safety of these products? Well, it, what we want, there's a lot of ways to get into the market. One is a food additive petition because you're making it, you're adding it to food, you're putting it into food, people eat it. And a food additive petition is the best process. Thorough FDA review, public comment, transparency, a right to challenge a decision. 
but that's probably not the way it's going to go. Another way is a company could in secret make a decision that it's safe, tell everybody that it's generally recognized as safe and put it in food without even telling FDA. And that is allowed. I'm hoping that none of these companies are so short-sighted as to do that. Another in between is you could make that decision and tell FDA and see if they have any questions. No public comment, limited transparency, and no ability to challenge or question the decision. So we prefer the food added to petition. But it seems that FDA is trying to create another method that's modeled on how it's handled from its view successfully GMO, or bioengineered products or new plant varieties. And what it's trying to do is just work with the company, do a pre-notice consultation, and then make an assessment and then issue a no questions letter. They might seek comment on it. They've talked about providing that transparency, but it isn't, it doesn't have the accountability that I think will provide the con consumers with the question. I'm looking at the Q&A right now, and a lot of people are like, how do we know this is safe? What is this? And that means you've got to engage the public. You've got to make sure they have a right to ask questions and you've got to answer the question. And that's what I don't see in the FDA review process right now. Yes, and I just like to pop in and I think given all the new science that we have in different areas, one thing I'm really concerned about with these uh, in vitro meats is they're going to be so primitive compared to the real thing that my question is what effect is this going to have on the microbiomes of people that are eating them you know because 10 to 15 years ago we couldn't study the microbiome because we didn't have the technology to be able to even identify all the bacteria that were there we could only study bacteria that we could physically culture we're now way beyond that and this incomplete lab-grown product, I would suspect, is going to have quite an impact on a microbiome. So I'd like to see some studies before these products ever make it to the market, because I think the kind of questions you ask are of food additives are appropriate, but there's more questions than that. Since this is a whole sort of food product, we really need to know what impact is this having, not only on the microbiome, but we now know that there are ways to influence the genome without touching the DNA. You can do these epigenetic, these tagging effects and literally have uh, effects for a couple generations, even though you've not technically changed the DNA. So what are the epigenetic effects of these new foods, not just additives, but whole new food products and what are the effects on the microbiome? So what I'm hearing those need to be those questions need to be asked in addition to the traditional toxicology questions. How much does it take to kill you? Does it cause <laughs> cancer? Does it cause reproductive effects, allergies? Those all remain. But I think these other issues of the effect on the microbiome and how is this affecting the um, epigenetics of the organism are important ones. Thanks, Michael. Um, just to Ori and everybody to the features of the Zoom, you'll see there's the chat. The best way to make sure your question is not buried in the chat is to use the Q&A function, which is just a little further right on your Zoom menu. Um, and we'll be trying to answer some questions later in the call. Um, between both of you, Michael and Tom, what I'm understanding is that the FDA has a sort of multi, uh, multiple choice um, review process. And it is potentially uh, available to these companies to get the product on the market without rigorous public comment. So that's sort of one stop sign we have that we all need to be sort of tuning into. Um, but even if the FDA went through its approval process in the most transparent and open way possible. What I hear you saying, Michael, is actually we also don't have the scientific modalities in place at the FDA to analyze the impacts of these foods, particularly on the gut microbiome. Well, I would say there's the science to be able to do that. There's not the regulatory oversight to require that. 
before the products come out on the market. And I would point out a number of years ago, the companies themselves were talking about they would like to take this grass, this generally recognized as safe approach where they get to decide for themselves what's safe and maybe tell the FDA and maybe not. For, for such a new technology, that is, um, I think that's horrendous that they're even considering allowing that. And it's a dereliction of FDA's duty if they do that. Well, in my you know, opinion, I, I'm with Michael on it. Just there are good scientists at FDA who can ask these questions and can insist on the questions being done. But if the process that management picks and the ones that the companies choose are the ones that bypass real review, where they have to answer the questions, yeah. not just get to ask them, then we can be more confident. But right now, what I see is it doesn't have the accountability and the insurability that for the companies trying to take the shortcut to market may end up undermining the whole integrity of the process. And remember, it doesn't take all the companies bypassing it. There's gotta be the one that really cuts the corners and goes to market. So you can undermine the credibility of the entire one. I'm an optimist. I wanna see these products succeed. I want to get them out. Even though some, a lot of people may not be comfortable eating them, there's enough demand for protein. There's enough need for sustainable solutions. There's enough need for climate when we uh, reduced impact uh, from agriculture. But we got to prove it. We can't just work on assumptions and guesses and promises. And right now, there's a lot of promises. I mean, Tom, I'm sort of floored that the idea of in vitro meat for you sounds like a positive potential addition to our already incredibly complicated and chemically laden food supply, but I digress. Julia, I'm wondering as you sort of think deeply about some of the problems with this industry, like what stands out for you? What haven't we touched on yet? that are sort of red flags in both the commercialization of these products and also the potential regulation or deregulation of them? Um, great question. A couple of things I've been thinking about, one of them has to do with intellectual property rights. So we don't actually know how this technology, if this technology is going to be available for mass scale use or if it's going to cost money to access the immortal cell lines or the special media that is created. It has similar uh, issues to me as the Green Revolution in the sense that you could have a scenario where you have to buy not the seed but the, the technology and then you have to buy all the inputs that are owned by other companies. Um, but in addition, another thing I wanted to flag, and I would love to hear Michael's input on this because I do think it's a serious issue, is when I was when I've been doing research on this the past couple of years, something that Michael says always sticks out, which is that animal cells do not have an immune system. And Michael, I'm hoping you can speak to that and what the potential implications are. Yeah, that's just the, you know, one of the arguments supposedly for these. Uh, subcultured systems is they can say, look, people, when they eat meat, they get E. coli, they get salmonella, they get all these bacteria from the environment. That's not going to happen with these cell cultured systems. And as I always point out, right, that's because, you know, living organisms do get diseases, but they also have a skin and an immune system, which protects them from that. So if you cut yourself, right, and you don't put something on there, you're immediately gonna get all sorts of bacteria and fungi and things that, uh, that, that go on. That's also a problem in the production environment. How to get those vats in truly sterile conditions because you're concerned about contamination from bacteria, fungi, mycoplasma, prions if you're getting them from the wrong source, viruses and all sorts of things. And I would just point out, even with um, when they produce alcohol, right, for uh, in these fermentation vats, they have to add antibiotics to actually kill the bacteria that might be produced there. So that's a whole other thing is these vat systems, you're going to have to be sampling for all these potential pathogens 
and things that could be getting in there from not only the outside and environment, but also from the sources themselves where you're getting um, your inputs. And I haven't seen anybody figure that out yet. Some people have actually talked about the need for that contaminant monitoring, but um, so far, when they've done things in a lab, everybody has had to use a bunch of antibiotics. They keep on saying, when we get to the production scale, we won't need to use any antibiotics. And all I say is, I believe that when I see it. I still have never seen a publication yet where they've been able to produce this stuff at any kind of scale without using antibiotics or other things to deal with the problems of contamination in the actual production systems they're using. Yeah. Yeah, Ashley, also to follow up on your question, I would just add that from my perspective, it seems like there are hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in this technology that has not been proven to be effective or to lead to any meaningful product as of right now. And I feel like all of that money could be diverted towards sustainable land-based solutions of which we know there are many. <laughs> Right. And we know that we keep being told that small scale, regenerative, diversified agriculture actually produces enough food to feed the world if there was an equitable distribution model. And yet we're being sold again and again, these highly technical, what I heard from you, Julia, corporate driven, privately owned solutions that stand to make a lot of money for the few in the name of the many. And this is just another iteration of that same logic that is governing and organizing our current food system. It's still beyond me though, beyond me, that we think that people are going to eat in vitro meat. I mean, Tom, when you say like, I want them to win, I want this to be a product on the market to help meet the demand for protein. Like, what do you imagine that consumer company relationship to look like? Like, do you imagine that this is gonna be sold like affordably to low-income communities that have food access issues? Like where are you imagining this success occurring? Well, obviously affordable is a key question. And I don't know what, the, we don't know what it's gonna cost. And they always start off high and the price comes down. I wouldn't be shocked if they use the impossible food model or impossible meat model of starting in the boutiques niche and then expanding. But so I don't know the model and that's something we're gonna need. I don't think people are, I mean, there are a lot of people that are anxious about those and other people who are interested in it. I think this may never get, I don't know how big the market will ever be, but I do see a growing demand for protein and something to meet that, that reduces some of the burden on, on the earth. And that can be, you know, there are different ways to produce the meat we have. I totally agree with you, Ashley and Julia. We need to do better all the way around. But is this, could this be a part of a solution? I think so. I'm not willing to rule it out based on the ick factor. I but think I the other thing that I just am very reminiscent of is the battle over GE labeling. And this very real looming truth that many of us felt the companies were fighting labeling because they knew if consumers saw genetically engineered on their candy or their chips or any highly processed food product, that they might be less likely to buy it. And so we felt that the companies were fighting labeling because they didn't trust the informed consumer. And I have a hard time believing that if a product had in vitro meat written on it, that folks would eat it. And so it also begs the question, like maybe the discerning customer is being deliberately kept in the dark on technologies and food because we know 
that folks don't really want food so far away from the natural ecological systems that have supported humanity thus far. Ashley, that's a really good point. And I think the GMO model of the reluctance to be honest with the public about it is disturbing um, and let the public choose. And that's one of the current controversies is what is the proper name? And you know, cell cultured and cell based, you gotta have the word cell in it to be clear, it's not wild raised, it's not wild caught or farm raised. And that was clear on a survey, but it's not clear that the developers of the products have bought into that. When it comes to the seafood, they have sort of settled on cell culture. But no matter what, we have to be consistently labeling it and clear about what it means. And if we don't want to recreate those battles over just being transparent about what something is, that would be a problem for the industry. And it would just fuel legitimate consumer concerns about the unwillingness to be honest. Yeah. And I think one problem with the labeling is going to be whether they use cell culture or cell based is a large number of the inputs that are going to be needed, the growth factors, everything else, they are going to be engineered. The industry is already ad ad admitting this. So many of the inputs are going to be genetically engineered. So these stuff, consumers show they want to know that this is all going to be, should be required to be labeled as genetically engineered or bioengineered or whatever you want to call it. And I know that the industry wants to get away from that. They quote, want to learn from the GMO discussion, but what they're doing is they're going to, they're turning around and hiding the fact that that's what a lot of their inputs are going to be because they can't get around being able to produce those growth factors any other way. And FDA and USDA are both trying to come up with what is the proper label for them now. And they've had that out for public comment. What they decide will matter. And just so people know, it's meats, it's USDA for meat and poultry, and then FDA for the fish <laughs> because of the strange way our food is regulated. So Tom, something that has occurred to me as I've heard you speak about the regulatory frameworks that would govern how these products come to market is that it the process is company driven. Is that correct? So I, as a developer of in vitro meat, I think that's my favorite term, by the way, is in vitro meat, um, would choose which process I wanted to go through prior to bringing my product to market. There's not just one fixed process. Is that correct? Correct. FDA has allowed companies to use the generally recognized the safe loophole to get products through. It's happened for about a thousand chemicals that are in our food now. So we've got to close that. It should be done with the food added to petition where FDA makes a decision where it's out for public comment, where it can be challenged, where Michael can ask the tough questions and Julia, you can ask the tough questions and make sure they get answered. And if you don't go to court. Here, here. Here, here. So we talked a little bit about labeling, um, whether or not these products would be labeled. How would they be labeled? Is there a, does this fit under the bioengineered or genetically engineered labeling schema? Or is this a new category because it's specifically an animal that is being produced? Anyone? That's an interesting question that I'm trying to think how FDA <laughs> might approach this. I could see them going either way. Is it, I mean, I know we have some lawyers on the Zoom. Is it required that a cell-based meat product be labeled at this point in time? It, if you look at FDA and USDA, what they said is, First of all, USDA requires that it review the label and, name, and make sure the name's right. So there's a check on that, but take seafood. They're both saying a common name that's where we really done it is clear. It's gonna be in the title. 
Um, I'm going to try to find a blog that we did where it had the three different images of names that it can do. I'm going to first send out one of FDA comments, uh, F a blog we did on FDA concerns with the process for those who want that. But let me find this other one where they laid out the different options and settled on cell culture. So the second one I'm posting is it's got at the top the images of the three options. Um, cultivated seafood, cell-based seafood, and cell-cultured seafood. Up in the top, in the label, not buried in the fine text, which is good. But FDA's test is, will people be confused? If people are going to think that this is farm-raised, or that this is, you know, uh, a wild caught, worse, then it's not acceptable. You're not allowed confusing the consumers that way. Michael, I'm just curious, like, do you, given all of your experience analyzing the introduction of te technologically driven foods into the food supply, do you actually think that this is going to significantly reduce the demand for meat? unless things drastically change, I don't know if that's true because th that hasn't proven to be true for the quote plant-based meat products, rather the Beyond Burger or the Impossible Burger, it hasn't seemed to dent much the consumption of meat products. That, but who knows, that may change in the, the future. It's just, I just wonder whether they're gonna be able to get this uh, this technology to really work. That's, that's my main concern are, are some of the technical limit, uh, limitations. Yeah, I mean, just intuitively, my sense is that folks that are turning to the Beyond Burger or potentially the Impossible Burger are folks that are already mostly plant-based that are looking to try a new option in the market. I personally haven't met flanks of meat eaters that are driving towards plant-based alternatives. Um, but yes, we never know um, what the consumer yeah. will do. You know, one thing that I will say about the labels is these things that have been put out by industry, what they're doing, if you read the, pu the publications, is they basically uh, show these different labels and then ask people what they think they mean and they take all this information and if you read it, what they don't want to do is anything if, if, if the people think that it, it contains engineered ingredients, right, then they don't want to go anywhere near that. So knowing that all of these ingredients that are going to be used in this production process are going to be engineered, when I read those publications where they come up and say sub base you can dive down into the guts of the article where they talk about, oh no, if we use these terms or say that there's engineered stuff in here, it, it'll scare people out of the way. And they wanna come up with a term that is, quote, doesn't mislead people as to whether it came from a living animal or not, but they also don't wanna give any kind of hint that it might contain engineered ingredients. And so yeah. that's where I think a really big fight is going to be. I mean, we're already seeing it a little bit in the chat. We have someone, Andrew Noyes, saying that in vitro or lab grown are inherently negative connotations and would handicap a nascent but growing industry. In terms of the well, promises of this industry, Michael, can you talk no, we about- did, All I'll say on that is, uh, you know, four years ago we could update it, but we did a survey of consumers and, and said, which of these terms would you prefer? Because I would go back and initially what industry wanted to call this stuff was clean meat, right? With the idea of being, oh, it's not gonna have any pathogens or, or any of the other problems with regular meat. And many people attack that. And when we surveyed consumers, the things that came near the top were either in vitro or lab meat, things that made it very clear where it came from. And if that might turn off some consumers, well, that's a marketing issue, but that's it. But that's really true. That's where it comes from. In vitro just is the technical word for, you know, grown in a petri dish or grown on glass, because that's what in vitro means. 
Yeah, I think my response to Andrew is if the truth turns consumers off, I think that's your issue. Um, again, folks, we have about 10 more minutes. So there's time for questions in the chat that you're welcome to ask, um, comments. There's a lot of questions, Michael, about the technical development of the meat and sort of, I know you're an evolutionary biologist and sort of can help explain what happens as the meat is grown in vitro and sort of what that process involves. Could you walk the, us through that in a, a little more Again, detailed manner? All I know about are the generalities because there hasn't been um, an independent look at this stuff. But again, what you're doing is you're taking cells from an animal that you've then turned into what are called usually stem cells and you grow them in a nutrient solution that, that has all these growth factors and has all the vitamins and amino acids and minerals and everything that the organism needs to grow uh, well to produce these uh, muscle tissues. What that's going to look at in terms of an end product, again, we don't know until we see publications on this. And we still haven't yet with the, de with the detailed analysis that scientists like myself would like to look at to see how similar and how different this is than meat that is uh, harvested from a live animal. Tom, I'm curious about if we swing back to the regulatory process and taking seriously your optimism and willingness to embrace this technology if it's proven safe, what would the evidence need to be for you to feel comfortable knowing that you yourself acknowledge the failures of the FDA and their ability to regulate our food supply to ensure that it's safe? What would you need to know that this is a welcome positive addition to our food system? I need to know that FDA scientists are actually heard and it's not management's failures to actually make decisions and not overriding. So there are good, really good scientists at FDA. Second, questions that Michael, Julia, and others ask have to be given an opportunity to be asked and actually answered. It's that last part that's often missed. So FDA has to have that transparent process. And FDA has to feel that if it's not going to answer those questions, that Michael or Center for Food Safety or Consumers Union they're gonna to go to court or EDF will go to court to challenge it. And that makes a difference when it comes to the agencies. It may take longer, but we'll get a better outcome. Knowing in Europe that they use the precautionary principle in the adoption of new technologies in food and in the environment, is there a process scientifically or otherwise, whereby we could prove that this was safe prior to mass marketing it to consumers in, this, in the United States? Like what would the precautionary approach look like? Uh, Michael? I would say them, uh, them following the food additive petition process. I mean, part of the issue is most of the things, the pesticides we put out on, on the market, other things, they are required to go through, they're sort of guilty until proven innocent. That's what the precautionary principle is. And what was funny is when the US tried to fight this internationally, when Europe was bringing it up internally, even though we had folks from our uh, government wanting, wanting to push this internally, scientists from the EPA and the FDA were going, well, you know, the way we regulate pesticides, those are guilty until proven innocent, right? You have to show they're safe before they can come on the market. That's what the law says for food and drugs. They're not following that. And that's why there are many groups trying to get the agency to follow the law the way it was written and meant to be implemented. So I would say if we did that, we would come closer to what the European Union is doing than not. I agree when it comes to the safety standard for additives, it's as strong or not stronger than the precautionary principle. It's the application of it. It's the broken regulatory system that a FDA has allowed the industry to take over and it needs to get it back under control. So it's not the safety standard. It's not the precautionary principle. 
nothing here, the standard for the US is reasonable certainty of no harm when you consider all the, the cumulative effect of all the related chemicals in the diet. They just don't do it. They don't even give it token language. They don't even acknowledge its existence. So that's the problem with FDA. I mean, I think that's coming, what's coming up for me, and, and we really saw this with pesticides and really helping folks to understand the difference between acute exposure and long range, low level chronic exposure. If you have a technology in the food system that could potentially have, let's say, as Michael argued, unknown low level effects in the gut microbiome, which can only be observed through a longitudinal study, how can we know that this is safe without having people eat it regularly for a long period of time? Well, I think there are studies that can be done now because science has advanced. And I will just point out, even though there's a lot of bad things the US has done, uh, they're starting to get things right. And I would just like to give one example and that's with PFAS, I know that's not the topic here, but our Environmental Protection Agency just last week came out and set what they said as a safe level for PFOA and PFAS that are in drinking water. They set it based on science and they set it at the level of four parts per quadrillion for PFOA, a 10,000 fold lower safety level than they had previously said. That is a win for science. Industry did not want that. That is a very clear win for science. So all I'm saying is that if you let the scientists make some of these decisions, we will come out in a better place. And that's just to say that if enough pressure is put on the government, they will do the right thing. It isn't completely captured, but mm -hmm. it's going to take significant pressure. Julia, what do you think? Sorry. Uh, what do I think about what exactly, Tom? Well, I mean, this issue of could we ever be confident enough in the safety? Could we ever have a good enough regulatory program that you would feel safe, confident in? Um, I'm a, um, that's a great question. As a younger person who has observed the FDA historically and the USDA and obviously worked in the field watching regulations be created. Um, I will just say that when I learned about grass, I was so deeply disappointed in our regulatory process. And when I read about things like, this isn't related to food specifically, but if you compare the a uh, number of ingredients and chemicals that are approved in the US for skincare products, for example, in comparison to Europe, or you look at food products, you look at the difference between baby formula here and the EU. I mean, it is so disheartening. I'm very skeptical and, you know, there's a lot of lobbying involved. There's a lot of money involved. Unfortunately, I'm pretty skeptical. Mm. You know, there's grounds for that, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be attentive to time. We've got about two more minutes. And we sort of, Michael was offering us a vision of hope, which is what I want to end with, because I think part of the purpose of these webinars is to give everyday folks the information that they need so that they can participate in their public regulatory processes, their legislative processes. They can support organizations like the Center for Food Safety that are taking these issues to court when the rules aren't followed. I'd love for each of you to end with like a brief sort of vision of hope on these issues, both for our food system, the systematic issues we're facing like climate change and malnutrition and obesity, um, and the advocacy around this. So I'll start with you, Tom. I think we need to make answer Julia's questions. I felt the same thing 12 years ago when I learned after thinking FDA was had it under control, how broken the system is. So I'm not optimistic on FDA. I'm hoping that this administration can clean up the problems. They've been 20, 30 years growing so that we could be confident. And until we get the confidence back, all these new technologies are gonna 
raise the ick factor, and they're also going to raise legitimate questions that go unanswered. We need to fix that. Mm, thanks, Tom. Michael, what's given you hope? Uh, yeah, this is sort of outside of this, but what gives me hope is that I think I see the world and to a certain extent the U.S. focusing more on taking an agroecological approach to solve our food production problems, not looking to technology. I see this as a looking to technology. I see the answer in the future is taking a more agroecological approach. It um, utilizes not only uh, regenerative agriculture, but also food sovereignty so that local populations are making more decisions over uh, the food they eat. And I do think the explosion of farmers markets and local and regional control, new foods that fit in with those models, I think are ultimately gonna be where the future is as opposed to these more industrial type models that people seem to wanna to follow. Thanks, Michael. And Julia? I uh, completely agree. And I want to say that I saw in the chat some references related to what's currently happening in industrial agriculture in relation to Kansas and cattle and bird flu and all of these potential issues currently happening. And I just want to say, you know, I don't think any person on this panelist would agree that our industrial animal agriculture system as it exists today works well at all. But I am not a techno optimist. I don't believe that technology creates solutions. I think technology as it is used today creates band-aids that then bleed into new problems. Um, but I'm a humanist and I believe in holistic solutions, solutions that you know, integrate microbiome, microbes, soil, animals all together, acknowledges that we're in a system and we have to work with the system. Hmm. So that's what gives me hope. Preach, Julia. <laughs> So we'll leave you there. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us today. You give me hope. Um, we're so happy to have you here. Um, you can follow us on all social channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we have a podcast that we're launching this fall. We also have a soil and microbiome report coming out later this year, which we hope will touch on some of the science on the interconnections between the health of our soil and the health of our microbiome. We're grateful you joined us today. This will be recorded and distributed across those social channels later in the month. Um, so thank you to our panelists, Michael, Tom, Julia, you are excellent conversationalists. And I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the fight for fair, clean, safe food. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.